We are probably not alone in the universe. This is why I think so. People often ask me if I think there's extraterrestrial life out there in the universe, and my answer is always the same. It's something along the lines of probably, or I'd be surprised if there wasn't. But a far more interesting and thought-provoking question is whether or not there's an advanced civilization of intelligent life forms out there. That's life that does maths and science, creates art and builds technology. It's life we could meaningfully communicate with rather than, say, microbes or my cat. This video is my attempt at answering that question. When talking about his new book, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking famously said, Someone told me that each equation I included in the book would halve the sales. Stephen Hawking ignored that advice, and I'm going to ignore it too, at risk of losing half of my viewers, because this entire video centres around an equation. Just one equation, mind you. It's called the Drake Equation. American astronomer Frank Drake devised his eponymous equation in the 1960s. It's a series of seven terms that, when multiplied together, yield n, the number of technologically advanced civilizations in the Milky Way with which we could communicate. The Drake Equation comes in many forms, and the one that I'll use is the one found in Carl Sagan's book Cosmos, which I read for the first time as a 16-year-old. And this is what the equation looks like. We'll go through each term in turn to yield our estimate for n. Now, disclaimer, all of this comes with a planet-sized pinch of salt. The seven terms become more and more speculative as we run through the equation, culminating in an n that is a wild approximation, at best. And so with that, let's look at the first term, n star, the number of stars in the Milky Way. We've all tried on at least one occasion to count the stars in the sky, but it's an exercise in futility because the Milky Way is a spiral galaxy 100,000 light years across. This is an artist's impression of what it looks like from a distance. We're nestled somewhere in one of its spiral arms about halfway out from the centre. Now, the galaxy is just too big and there are too many stars to count individually, even with our best telescopes, and so we have to make do with estimates. Astronomers normally estimate the number of stars to be somewhere in the 100 billion to 400 billion ballpark, but some estimates have it as high as a trillion. And so for the purposes of the Drake equation, I'll assume a middle of the road 200 billion stars in the Milky Way. But how many of those stars are planets? That brings us to the second term, FP, the fraction of those stars that have planets. When Drake first came up with his equation, exoplanets, they're planets outside of our solar system, were purely hypothetical. Even back in 1980, when Carl Sagan published Cosmos, we still didn't know if exoplanets really existed. But today, we know that they're everywhere. The first two were discovered in 1992, orbiting a pulsar, the dense remnants of a star that exploded. And since then, we've discovered many, many more. Today, we know of almost 6,000 exoplanets. Most of them were discovered by measuring the slight dimming of a star's brightness as a planet passes in front of it known as the transit method. Almost 3,000 exoplanets were discovered by NASA's planet-hunting Kepler mission alone. It seems every star in the sky is accompanied by an exoplanet. Most, if not all, stars have them. And so, for the purposes of the Drake equation, I'll dial that number back ever so slightly and assume that 90% of stars have planets. But planets need to be habitable to have a life, by definition. This brings us to the third term, NH. Of the stars that have planets, the average number of habitable worlds per star. This is where things become more speculative. In our own solar system, there's only one world that we know for sure is habitable, the Earth, but there might be more. Mars had liquid water on its surface before three billion years ago, and today probably has liquid water trapped in rocks miles beneath the ground. It's also rich in organic compounds, as evidenced by their discovery on the surface from the landers and their detection in Martian meteorites. Mars was probably habitable in the distant past, and it might still be today. Some of our solar system's icy moons might be habitable too. Europa, an icy moon of Jupiter, probably has a warm interior and a subsurface ocean of liquid water. And Enceladus, an icy moon of Saturn, definitely has a warm interior and might have a subsurface ocean up to 25 miles deep. It's so geologically active that it's got jets of water ice spraying from cracks in its surface. And Titan, another icy moon of Saturn, is made from a mixture of organic mush and water. It's so rich in organic chemistry that it literally rains liquid hydrocarbons. There are other potentially habitable moons too. Jupiter's Callisto and Ganymede, Saturn's Mimas and Dione, and Neptune's Triton. But we just don't know for sure. And so whilst there's definitely one, maybe two, habitable planets in our solar system, there are maybe eight or more habitable moons. And so for the purposes of the Drake equation, I'll be conservative and assume that there are three habitable worlds per star. But a habitable world doesn't guarantee life, so what are the odds? That brings us to the fourth term, FL the fraction of habitable worlds where life actually originates. This one is even more speculative. Exactly how life on Earth originated? 
we just don't know. Scientists are still working on it. But what we do know is that life originated very, very quickly. Here's a timeline of Earth's history. The earliest fossil dates back almost three and a half billion years. The earliest mineral traces of life dates back 3.7 billion years. And tenuous evidence based on carbon isotopes in ancient grains of zircon pushes back life's origin even further, sometime before 4.1 billion years. This is remarkably quickly, given that the Earth is only 4.5 billion years old. On Earth, it seems that as soon as life could arise, it did. And so it might follow that if life can arise, it does. Which is why I think that life is probably very common out there in the Milky Way. Admittedly, I am basing this on a single data point, the Earth, but it is all we've got to go off. And so for the purposes of the Drake equation, I'll assume that there's an 80% chance that life will arise on a habitable world. They're pretty good odds, all things considered, but what's the chance that that life will become intelligent? That brings us to the next term, Fi the fraction of inhabited worlds where life evolves intelligence. Most people would agree that octopuses are intelligent. They'd also agree that ravens, dolphins, and orangutans are too. They all use tools, they all solve problems, and they all show flickers of self-awareness. But none of them come close to Homo sapiens. Us. We are the only species that's generated complex abstractions such as language and mathematics. We make incredibly sophisticated tools for probing and interrogating material reality. We consciously conceptualize the future, we're the only ones who know that we're going to die one day. These things and more set us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. We're just different. And so I think it's fair to say that in the context of the Drake equation, humanity is the only intelligent species on Earth. Our lineage, Homo, branched off the tree of life about two million years ago. And assuming life originated 3.7 billion years ago, means it took 3,698,000,000 years after life originated for it to become intelligent. That is a really, really long time. And so whilst I think that life is common out there in the Milky Way, I think intelligent life is probably incredibly rare. And so for the Drake equation, I'll assume that if life does arise, there's a one in 2000 or a 0.05% chance that it will become intelligent. But intelligence isn't quite enough. What are the odds that life becomes communicative? For that, we'll go to the next term, FC, the fraction of intelligent life forms that become communicative. Now, by communicative, I don't just mean the ability to talk as you or I would. I mean the ability to talk over interstellar distances using radio astronomy. By beaming radio waves across the galaxy, an extraterrestrial civilization could let its whereabouts be known. And by pointing radio dishes at the sky, a civilization could listen for others. And so for the Drake equation, a communicative civilization is one that does radio astronomy. By this definition, humanity is communicative. We've been doing it since the 1930s. Sure, there are probably more advanced methods of interstellar communication, but radio astronomy is quite simple, all things considered, and it does happen at the speed of light. This definition of communicative might sound a bit parochial and a bit human-centered at first, but it does make sense in this context. Radio astronomy is probably universally practiced by advanced civilizations. Modern humans emerged on the scene about 200,000 years ago, and we started practicing modern science about 400 years ago. On an evolutionary timescale, that's nothing. It happened incredibly quickly. And this, I think, means that as soon as intelligence emerges, science follows fast. And as soon as a species starts doing science, it won't be long until it stumbles upon radio astronomy and becomes communicative it's almost inevitable. And so for the Drake equation, I'll assume that if intelligence does arise, there's a 99% chance that it will become communicative. Which brings us to the seventh and perhaps most important term, FT, the fraction of a planet's lifetime graced by an advanced civilization. If an advanced civilization invents radio astronomy, as we have, it's likely that they'll invent much of the other technologies we have too. Some of these technologies, medicine, space travel, asteroid deflection, will promote their survival into the far future. Whilst other technologies, ones that wreck the environment, biological warfare, atomic warfare, make it more likely that they'll extinguish themselves in a quick flash of self-destruction. I suspect that if an advanced civilization doesn't destroy itself straight away, if it gets through what Carl Sagan called its technological adolescence, it will probably survive for a long, long time. Like a kind of filter, technology makes civilizations either live forever or die fast. Which way it goes depends on the choices they make. If rapid self-destruction is common, then FT will be tiny, giving us a small number for N. But if they don't self-destruct, 
FT will be huge, and so N will be huge. I'll make a quick case for each, starting with the glass half empty scenario. It sometimes feels like our technological progress is outstripping our capacity for making sound judgments. This makes it quite easy to imagine a scenario where an advanced civilization such as ours destroys itself pretty quickly. Let's assume that an advanced civilization wipes itself out about a hundred years after acquiring advanced technology. As a fraction of a planet's lifetime, and assuming that the planet lasts about 10 billion years, a century is a mere zero 0.000001%. Plugging in this value for FT completes the Drake equation. N equals 2. There are two advanced civilizations in the Milky Way. That's not many. And given the enormous uncertainty on all of these terms, it could well be less than that. The upshot is that we're alone. There's no one else. It's just us. Or, on the other hand, maybe self-destruction is rare. I mean, we're still here, and using science and technology, implemented with sound government and good policy, we are making the world a better place in the long run. Lifespans are up practically everywhere. Global child mortality is down and falling. Deaths from natural disasters are down compared to where they were 50 years ago. We're getting better at launching things into space, an essential step if we're to become an interplanetary species. Sure, there are too many problems in the world, there's no getting away from that, but on the whole, things are improving, and we're not doing too badly, all things considered. Perhaps using science and technology to thrive and ensure long-term survival is the norm amongst advanced civilizations. If they can just get through that first century of technological adolescence, I can easily imagine a situation where advanced civilizations last practically forever. And so, let's assume that if an advanced civilization makes it through the first century, it lasts for a billion years, which, assuming a planet lasts about 10 billion years, is 10%. Plugging in this value for FT gives us the following. N equals 21 million. There are 21 million advanced civilizations in the Milky Way. That is a big number. Even if it's off by a factor of 10 or 100 or even 1,000, it means that the Milky Way is brimming with advanced civilizations. The upshot is that we're far from alone. We are definitely not the only ones. I think advanced civilizations are either incredibly common or incredibly rare. I just don't see a situation where we're somewhere in the middle. Now, let's say my optimistic scenario is correct and the Milky Way is full of communicating civilizations. This begs the obvious question. Where on earth is everybody? Why is it so quiet? Why haven't we heard from anybody? That quandary is called the Fermi Paradox, named after the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. But I'm going to leave that for another video. For now, I'll give final word to Arthur C. Clarke. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. And I tend to agree. If you enjoyed this video, you should know I've published it on my Substack too drtimgregory.substack.com. It's completely free to read, and so head on over there to subscribe. I'll be posting lots there in the coming months. Until next time.